This video is brought to you by me. For $1 a month, you can support the channel directly and help me keep doing what I love. Thanks for watching and supporting. After finishing Infamous 1, I realized that I had finished the game, but the story wasn't exactly over. Cole McGrath had much more to do to save the world, and the gameplay from the first game was so enjoyable that I felt this urge to keep going. When I first played these games, enough time had passed between them that I initially didn't think they were all that different. However, now that I've played both essentially back to back, I feel a stark difference and growth between the two. And it's because of this difference between the games that makes me feel like Infamous 2 is one of the best games on the PS3 in retrospect. I don't know if you've ever let someone down, got your ass kicked, or straight up failed. But those are the moments that define us. They push you further than you've ever thought possible and force you to make choices. No matter what the cost. Infamous 2 is a direct sequel to Infamous 1, in that very little time has passed between when we see the credits roll in the first game and when the sequel starts up, as Cole, Zeke, and their newfound NSA agent friend Lucy Kuo are about to embark on a boat trip from Empire City to Southern City, New Marais, the worst case scenario happens. The towering monster that Kessler warned Cole about in the first game, the Beast, appears and wreaks havoc on the city, destroying everything in its path. After narrowly escaping its grasp by hitting him with a bolt of lightning, the beast zaps Cole's powers, draining him of most of his abilities and starting the story off in the normal sequel way of making sure you're not too strong off the bat. As Cole recovers on the boat, it keeps chugging onward to New Marais. During his recovery, Cole is left to ponder how he can stand any chance against this foul beast that is demolishing the entire East Coast as it chases him. Quo assures Cole that Dr. Wolf, one of the lead engineers on the Ray Sphere project, the device that awakened Cole's powers in the first game, was the missing puzzle piece Cole needed to prepare for the next showdown. As the boat approaches the swamp surrounding New Marais, the turmoil in the city rears its head and sets the tone for the rest of the game. An anti-conduit tyrant named Joseph Bertrand III has assembled a militia to patrol the streets and arrest anyone suspected of being a conduit in order to keep the peace. Think the Red Scare meets New Orleans. As Cole and Quo try to find their new mentor, Bertrand's men kidnap Wolf and destroy his lab. Luckily, Wolf managed to save the Rayfield inhibitor from being destroyed. This device, known as the RFI for short, is an anti-ray sphere that can take powers away from conduits. All Cole needs to do to power it is absorb enough blast cores to boost himself up. But after absorbing the first core and passing out, Cole awakens to the news that Wolf has been kidnapped. During a rescue mission involving a car chase, Wolf is killed and Quo is taken hostage. This shapes the story as, without Wolf, Cole and Zeke have no idea where Quo is or where any of the cores are. Zeke, still trying to amend his relationship with Cole after the events of the first game, hatches a plan to infiltrate the militia to get intel on Quo, Bertrand, and more cores. Of course, none of this happens immediately, which means Cole has time to explore the city and craft the image of how he wants to be viewed. Like the first game, Cole has control over if he's viewed as a good or evil person. As he explores the city, Cole can perform tasks that shape his karma. He has the option to heal civilians injured by the militia to give him good karma, or he can take Zeke's awful advice to kill any street performer because he finds them annoying, which, understandably, makes him more evil. As opposed to the first game where the karma was essentially just a skill tree, the karmic decisions Cole must make throughout the game actually do have an effect on the story, but we can talk about that when we get to the plot. The new location of New Marais is a vast improvement over Empire City. Where Empire City was a concrete jungle of many districts consisting of the same gray buildings, New Marais has its own distinct flavor as it's based on New Orleans. Buildings and districts are different and interesting to look at while you climb. Buildings are also equipped with poles you can grab to launch you from ground level to the roof in one action, making navigation fun and quick. It wasn't a chore in Infamous 1, but I'm not going to deny that streamlining speeds things up. Overall, I think New Marais is a far more interesting place for the game to happen in. But as quickly as the fun of saving people and stopping muggings arrives, it disappears as Zeke brings Cole information on Quo's whereabouts. Cole sets off to save her from a shed the militia is keeping her in. He finds her unconscious, strapped into this grotesque machine used to transfer powers from conduits. As it turned out, Quo had the conduit gene all along, and the militia activated it so they could transfer her ice abilities to their own men. It's pretty unsettling. Much like the first game, the story doesn't sugarcoat what superpowers do, and in fact presents them in a grim, heavy light. 
Once Quo has been freed from the machine, she's left with a body she no longer recognizes and has power she has trouble controlling and maintaining. Infamous One skipped over Cole learning how to wrangle his powers outside of a short cutscene. But here we see just how difficult it is for Quo to come to terms with her life changing, and on top of that, she's now a target of Bertrand's militia. It's raw and emotional, and seeing it all play out genuinely put a pit in my stomach. She was tortured, suffering for these powers she didn't even want, and now she's stuck with them. But Quo isn't the only conduit Cole meets along the way. Nyx is a firebending, sludge-shooting badass who is seeking revenge for her family. She gained her powers as she witnessed Bertrand himself use the Ray Spear to give himself powers. In the blast that echoes the events of the Empire City incident in the first game, hundreds of people were killed in the explosion. Nyx's mother was one of those casualties. It's during this anecdote we learn the truth behind Bertrand and his mission to kill conduits. Bertrand himself didn't really gain any powers alone, but rather he can hulk out into this fugly monster that raises hell out of his control. In his own shame and rage, Bertrand sets his sights on the eradication of conduits. He thinks that if he can make normal people turn on them, the human race will kill them for him. While the situation seems pretty bleak initially, Cole and Zeke learn of a resistance group led by a veteran, Roscoe LaRoche. LaRoche and his men don't believe in Bertrand's cause because they've seen the destruction and loss of life the militia has brought with them. Using his new alliance, Cole tracks down the blast cores and tries to charge himself up as the beast keeps inching closer to New Marais. Every time Cole cracks a blast core, he powers up and becomes stronger while unlocking new abilities that help him in combat. Infamous 2's combat system is extremely refined. Not only can Cole gain new abilities, but he can also upgrade them with experience he gets by disposing of enemies in creative ways. The biggest quality of life change comes in the form of being able to hot swap abilities on the fly, allowing you to change grenades, beams, and shockwaves you have at any given moment. Despite having his powers drained at the beginning of the game, Cole starts to feel very powerful very quickly, including a newly refined melee system that was seriously lacking in the first game. Zeke creates a weapon called the Amp, which allows Cole to channel his electricity into a tuning fork and wail on enemies. He can even refill his electric meter by draining enemies with finishing moves. But as Cole powers up, the egos and personalities in his team start to clash and pull him in different directions. Quo tries to keep Cole's eyes on the straight and narrow, while Nyx is persuading him to unleash his powers on the city so the people inside will fear him. This is where the karmic system actually starts to matter. As you consistently choose sides, Quo or Nyx will lose respect for Cole and get frustrated. Since I was playing the good guy, Nyx disappeared for a bit as she got fed up with Cole ignoring her ideas. But where the first game really left a lot to be desired in terms of lasting repercussions, your decisions in 2 lead to very different endings you get to be a part of. As Cole gets closer to powering the RFI, John White from the first game, who is presumed dead, appears to Cole with new information and confides in him that he is actually the Beast. John explains that the Ray Sphere created a disease caused by exposure to radiation that is running rampant across the world, only further spread by the Beast's voyage down the coast. If John doesn't save the conduits, humanity will perish, so he tries to get Cole to side with him to save them as humanity crumbles. He also explains that charging the RFI will kill every conduit while not guaranteeing humans will be cured of the plague. So now Cole has a choice. Does he side with the beast and save only a select few to ensure that humans carry on in smaller numbers, or does Cole sacrifice himself and every conduit across the globe and risk humanity as a whole dying with only a chance to save millions? Of course Cole's team have their opinions on the matter. Quo wants to turn her back on humanity because she's afraid of death, and Nyx wants Cole to sacrifice the conduits out of fear of a world where everyone has superpowers. Again, I played the good guy and decided the right thing to do was sacrifice conduits for the millions of potential lives saved, which the game agreed was the good move. Now with the beast inside New Marais, the story begins to wind down. Cole must make his choice. In the good ending, Cole and Nyx must charge the RFI by bringing it to stations around the city while the beast chases them, attempting to stop it. Quo sides with the beast and appears to fight Cole and stop him from charging the device. In a last ditch effort, Nyx sacrifices herself to the beast, giving Cole just enough time to charge the RFI fully. In a final coming to peace moment, Quo apologizes to Cole, explaining how she's scared of death, and Cole doesn't blame her for it. He's terrified too. He presses the button. Cole, Quo, and the Beast drop dead along with thousands of other conduits. As the final cutscene played out, I felt sad. I know Cole did the right thing, but he gave up everything to be the hero. By the end of the first game, he had lost his best friend, his love, and his freedom to fade into the background. 
At the end of Infamous 2, he's finally the hero he wanted everyone to see he was, but he wasn't around to see the fruits of his ultimate sacrifice. And to me, that's what this series gets right. Doing the right thing doesn't necessarily get you a gold star or a pat on the back. Doing the right thing is a choice you have to make for yourself, even if it means you'll be worse off in the end for the greater good. As the final screen dipped to black, I caught myself staring at the TV knowing there was no after credit sequence, but still hoping there was something else there showing that Cole might still be okay. After the course of the two games, I had shaped this character to be the best hero he could be. I had grown far more attached to Cole than I'd realized I had. In most games, a story follows a given path, the decisions made for you. But in Infamous, and the sequel especially, I had directly led Cole to his demise. I felt so bad for him. Infamous 2 was a superhero story we rarely see. It showed the burden and weight of having superpowers and being in the public eye. People who the characters have never met have strong opinions about them and what their intentions are. It was refreshing no matter how crushing the ending was. I forgot after all these years how well done a superhero struggle can be, and Infamous is the perfect example of how well a story around these cartoony, tight-wearing people can be crafted. Thanks for watching my videos on the Infamous games, I really appreciate it. If you like the videos, please consider leaving a like on them, it helps me out more than you realize. What did you think of the Infamous games? Did you go the evil route, or did you play the Guardian? Let me know in the comments down below. If you want to see more videos like this, please consider subscribing to the channel, and if you really want to support the channel directly, you can go to my Patreon page down below in the description. You can get exclusive content for just $1 a month. Since YouTube is so weird these days, my videos aren't being moved at all, so one thing that can help too is sharing one of my videos with a friend or a relative who might appreciate it. Anyway, thanks so much for watching it all. I'd like to take a minute and thank my higher tier patrons, Andrew Lang, 8BitJesus, Sebastian Pereira, and Andrew Elmore. See you in the next video.